Hello. <laughs> Hi. Hi. So we're, t we're the Microbiology uh, Journal Club, and we we're here to talk about interesting microbiology. This is our off week where you look at the microbiology news, things that have been hitting the headlines that are interesting to us, and we, we're trying to get a first look on some of the papers that we find interesting that we might want to talk about. Yep. Yeah, so our on week, we pick one of the papers that we picked today. We'll talk about our on week. We'll dive into the figures more, um, talk about how the data was collected. Yeah. But here, we're trying to do an overview. Um, and uh, yeah. Yeah. There's um, we have a oh if it we're open to suggestions if people want to suggest papers that you'd like to uh, cover um, you know give us the hashtag at uh, Micro Twitter Journal Club yep. or um, our tags yep. below. Um, and then we also have a Zotero um, which is like a shared citation manager um, and we keep track of all the things that we talk about there. Yeah, the links in the doobly doo. So if you want to like take a look at all, we've we've got a bunch of papers. We spent a lot of time like, well, Dan Danny's spent a lot of time classifying them and putting them into order. So you be so you can, some time. <laughs> yeah, but, so it's it's nice because it actually it lays out what we know about coronavirus and quite in like a number of quite important papers. And I think it's quite useful to have that kind of resource. So if people are interested, they can delve into some of the interesting re original research that we've been looking at for sure for sure yeah i threw a folder in there too uh, that says online collection through the course of us talking about this we've like identified some like websites that have like a lot of information yeah um and uh yeah so there's that as well other people are doing similar things but everyone has their own hot take <laughs> yeah and i mean there are hot takes of plenty because this this uh this like, cut past two weeks has been a real like kind of vaccine bonanza so we're gonna introduce a special segment that I'm going to call the COVID-19 Vaccine Olympics. <laughs> Who will win? <laughs> Place your bets now. <laughs> well, I hope there's no betting. There's no betting in the Olympics, right? That that's or There maybe is betting around the Olympics I mean, in places where betting is legal. <laughs> I'm sure there's betting on, like, everything. If... <laughs> <laughs> but... Yeah, I have this image of, like, those... I've seen them in, like, strip malls. They're kind of, like... Um... Places like you bet on horses and things, right? Always a little bit seedy, with like some alcohol being served. Oh. Maybe people are betting on the COVID vaccines. I mean, the, <laughs> if you look at investment into biopharma, there are definitely people betting on the different coronavirus. Oh, things. sure, absolutely. So yeah, there are definitely people who have like got their skin in the game and trying, and and it's understandable because the first person to first company to make a coronavirus vaccine, well. It could they could be very profitable or they could end up in disaster depending on <laughs> yeah yeah well I mean it's, it's I mean I heard that the uh, even even before a company makes it I'm sure there'll be bids to purchase some supply of it so there's also that right yeah that, that definitely you there's... may be able to secure monetary support just by showing really good data um, yeah I mean that's one, one of the reasons why you see so many like companies announcing the results via press release because uh, th that increases like a lot of people go well that's quite good that's a good bet I'll put I'll put some money towards them and maybe I'll get something back or maybe the entire community will get something back from us supporting this vaccine uh, right uh, the, uh, which is a, you know is a bit of a pet peeve of ours though because it's like oh it's nice to know that but like can you show us like some of that data oh yeah can we also know that other scientists have seen this data and had their piece to criticize it I and mean, you don't get that with a press release. Yeah. And I, I know that there are like proper investors are who know who understand this field are like also saying that same thing because like mm -hmm. they they know that like scientific results, especially preliminary ones, can vary a lot from what happens in reality because you've mm. got some you got very working with very small sample sizes. Sometimes you're working with uh, animals who are very different from humans. There are lots of like little things that can interrupt your your perfect plan to have a good vaccine. So Yeah. So it, <clears throat> spread your spread your bets around to the all of them. I'd say if I was giving <laughs> advice, but I don't don't take advice from me. I'm not a, an investment <laughs> type person. I'm just like a scientist. You heard it here first. Invest in <laughs> invest in what we recommend. No, yeah, just... invest in what like, comment, and subscribe. Invest in us. <laughs> <laughs> so who do we have in the running for the vaccine? Well, <laughs> uh, <the> <laughs> in in the lead at the moment is has just published a phase two trial. It's CanSino. So this is an interesting one because they use a human adenovirus uh, with which expresses the spike protein of the COVID-19 mm. and 
Yeah, so we the, talked about the Chadox in a previous week. Uh, yes, we did. also an adenovirus expressing the spike protein, but this is a human adenovirus. <laughs> yeah. And Chadox is, with the CH, is a chimpanzee adenovirus. Yeah. <clears throat> and and that's the interesting thing, that, that kind of, while this is like, they, they're undoubtedly the ones that have gotten the furthest in their trials in terms of publications, because they're all the way up to phase two. Yeah. But there is like kind of a, an issue with their... their their vaccine that uh well i mean the thing is that human adenoviruses yes, this, are... this is the lancet article right immunogenicity yeah. and safety of recombinant adenovirus type 5 vector covid okay yes uh so i mean i'll pop onto the screen share if i can uh find it uh oh yeah there it is okay right uh, yeah you were saying oh yes so yeah uh yeah so we've got like uh so yeah, it's a very long title, but the uh, main is issue with it is that that it's a human adenovirus. So these adenoviruses are naturally found in humans, and so if you've had this before, you might already have immunity to it. Mm -hmm. And so if there's a and, and if you have immunity to it, it means that the adenovirus can't infect you, which means it can't put the spike protein inside of your cells, which means you're not going to see that antigen, and you might not make the antibodies. Yeah, mm -hmm. and. It, and it's another another thing is that they yeah so they actually like measured this because they, they look at people who already have like immunity and they found that there is actually a significant po population of people who might already be immune to this vaccine so so the vaccine just won't take yeah which is and yeah, again there wasn't it's not like new for them right like because they're going down this path of a human adenovirus like they have to like the 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 scientific community is ready to say, like, this is a major concern. So show us the data that's going to have us believe otherwise. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, so that's like part of the reason I think they're being trying to be as transparent as possible with it, trying to show us all the data. Yeah. And yeah, and it is a, there, there is like equivalent, equiv so it's not the best. So it's unfortunate the first one isn't necessarily the best one the, that we But I mean, see. the other thing is it's, it's like going to be not the best but that doesn't mean it's not going to work in you for example right like yeah. you, no one knows right uh, people don't do serology testing for a regular human adenovirus um on the regular so no one really knows their adenovirus immunity status um yeah. and it just yeah so it's a complication um but i think the reason why it's probably gone the furthest is because like this vector is well known right mm. to to be used i think it's one of the first sort of vectors for gene therapy in humans. Um, it, it actually might be the one that, uh, I don't know if you know this story, but like uh, so someone was saying like the first time gene therapy was done in human, it's done with an adenovirus vector, but there's like this big immune response in the lung. It was delivered to the lung. And yeah. you can imagine like bad things. So like it made an immune response in the lung, someone got pneumonia, it was like not a good scene. Oh, so then no one touched adenovirus gene therapy research for many years after that right and that's oh, yeah. where we got the the separate um, branch that looked into the chimpanzee adenoviruses to say oh well maybe let's like slightly change that virus right yeah. and go down a path where maybe it doesn't cause um i don't remember if that's where they also went down the path of doing the replication deficient but in general these days they're also using replication deficient adenovirus um so you know lots of different things to like prevent like an immune response to the vector <laughs> and then hopefully that gives us the ability to have an immune response to the actual um thing that's delivered yeah uh and so i mean i think it's interesting from a scientific perspective but i mean then so on so at the moment they they seem to be like in the lead but they seem to have like a gammy leg in terms they're not gonna they might not finish the race um yeah <laughs> and and this is the lead in publication, right? Because I think there are others that people have said are in phase three. But oh, we just yeah. don't see, just haven't seen the data. Yeah, I mean, I think this one's in phase three, but we haven't seen the data yet. Mm -hmm. um, so what else is there, there in phase? So uh, let's see. Uh, chat. We did talk about Chadox. Uh, so yes. yeah. So we uh, I think we might just we discovered like because uh, we discussed it before in like primates because mm -hmm. I think because it had like some data in primates and there was some like kind of back and forth about whether like it was a pr actual proper protective immune response mm -hmm. but so i mean this one is pr uh, probably like one of the most hyped v versions out there uh 
There is. Well, maybe I'm. I'm guessing it's very hyped also because you're in the UK, right? Yeah. <laughs> you, you, feel, you hear the hype also in your zone. I've heard about it, but I also am really bad at following the news. <laughs> yeah, so this was published. In, so they published a phase one uh, single, well, phase one slash two single blind randomized control trial. Uh, Nature <laughs> vaccines. Uh, oh, wait. NPJ vaccines, uh, right? Oh, yeah. They, well, actually, we've... They, they published two papers. So there's one in oh. Nature va Vaccines where they did preclinical pre data in pigs and mice. Uh, ah. And there's one in The Lancet where they did d data in uh, in people. So, mm. I mean, obviously pigs and mice data is quite interesting because you, because you can get like quite a, oh, yeah, yeah. quite a lot of different uh, like data that you wouldn't get from humans. Whereas humans, you get a very small like... But essentially, like this is very similar to how we... The study we looked at with the uh, Pfizer bio mm -hmm. BioNTech, so it's a phase one slash two trial. So they do some safety mm -hmm. data. They look at like well, what are the side effects, because the last thing we want is a vaccine that accidentally hurts people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, um, and that's so... also a function of right, like, and efficacy is somehow a function of that as well, because if it's also not very effective, you give it to a lot of people, right? Then then just like the small amount of side effects that might occur in people that's also not a good thing right like you it's both right everything's hand in hand that something that's not very effective could also be potentially not that great because you give it to so many people and um some people have a bad reaction just because <clears throat> yeah so you want to start off like very with a small group because you don't want to have massive amounts of people having mm -hmm. bad reactions because mm -hmm. that does not look good for for anything uh so yeah they, they yeah i see this like... one. Oh, you yeah. threw it up on the screen <clears throat> Uh, so yeah, uh, let's see. Um, so they I say mean, prime boost in this, so it's like a boost. They're also boosting the vaccine. Is that what it means? Prime boost. I, I think assume. so. Yeah. Uh, so let me check <laughs> the methods. Uh, so uh, da, 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 prime da, boost group two dose. Yeah, booster vaccine administered twenty eight days after the first dose. <laughs> yeah. So I mean that's an inter interesting one because like again we we know that adenoviruses can be immunogenic so the qu qu concern is that uh, they might not take the second prime dose if sure they, absolutely uh, but then again yeah you... but boosting is also good because it reinforces your immune system right to, yeah. to make the antibodies against it so yeah it, it's interesting you went down that strategy yeah you sort of said that that's one of the caveats is that you could develop a immunity to the um to the wrong antigen yeah to the wrong antigen to the vector but but, it's interesting, yeah. yeah Phase one slash two, okay. Yeah, it's a uh, we've seen quite a lot of studies like that. So uh, right. we mentioned too, it's like it's because people want to spend less time and money on this this event, right? So instead of spreading it out, and it's very common though, even before this time, people don't like <laughs> don't often do the separate one and two if there's good evidence that the safety is going to be um, okay, uh, yeah. then they'll want to knock off some. Um, some dose escalation to figure out uh, a good efficacy endpoint as well. Yeah, uh, let's see, and also uh, Moderna. Like, so I don't. Cause so I think we did talk about the Moderna new vaccine. They also had a phase one slash two trial, but mm -hmm. it was in one of our lost episodes because I had some sound issues, unfortunately. Ah. So, <laughs> uh, so let's see if I can pull that up. That'd be New England Journal of Medicine. Uh, so let's see if we can so yeah. So preliminary vaccine against SARS CoV two preliminary report. Yep, Jeff that's right. <clears throat> so Yeah, yeah we we one... actually talked about this two weeks ago as well. Yeah. But in uh, in our lost episode, unfortunately. Oh, I see. But, I see. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, this is another phase one slash two trial where they look in it's do safety data in human. They look at T cells, which is a, a thing one thing that was missing from the Pfizer vaccine trial that we're looking at, and something we talked about quite in length last episode with the T cell immunity. Um, so yeah, this is uh, another another. F so again, this one seems like it's got quite a good. I mean, the thing about these trials is they are subject to lo lots of variations, so it's very hard to like interpret how like effective it will be in the large population from this small cohort. Mm -hmm. but, the, wait, yeah. the T cell vaccine, the T cell responses, that's actually in the BioNTech one. Oh, right. Was it? Okay. Right. Is the T cell, you're speaking about the MedArchive concurrent human antibody 
oh. and TH1 type T cell responses is like yeah. COVID-19 RNA vaccine. So there are two, are like for those who might not have followed, there are two vac RNA vaccine candidates that are sort of in the lead runnings. Yes. Right? One is the Moderna one, um, which I've heard a lot about because maybe it's in the States. <laughs> like, yeah. They pump that one a lot. And, oh, and then also I think that this, the, the Pfizer one, that was in the news because like people, I think there was a there was a pre-order. <laughs> yeah. Right. I think like the United States government put a pre-order down for it. <laughs> but anyways, um, yeah, they funded that Kickstarter. <laughs> yeah. It, it, yeah. So they they're both they're both RNA vaccines. They're both use lipid nanoparticles to deliver the yeah. RNA. Um, and the Med Archive paper that we have, uh, concurrent human antibody TH2. That's that's looking at the BioNTech's response. Yeah, which so again, which is nice for us because yeah. we talked about that BioNTech. We already talked about the BioNTech phase one slash two, um, so it is nice to see. And then, and then the week after, we talked about TH1 responses. So it's we're, we're getting there. Yeah. So this is like it's nice that it builds up a picture. The, mm -hmm. the only issue with the Pfizer BioNTech one is that the so I think we did mention briefly when they're talking about like the Pfizer vaccines that in the clinical trial they're testing four different vaccine candidates. So mm -hmm. the so um. I think the ones we were looking at was were, were candidate one, uh, which was yep. based on like RB re receptor binding. I mean, fold, fold on proteins that like kind of create nanoparticles of just these receptor binding proteins. Mm -hmm. um, they've chosen not to advance that further to further trials. What they've chosen to do is pick another vaccine candidate that, that we have no data on, uh, which is yeah. Uh, which was based right. on the full length spike protein. And this and this paper we have in front of us, concurrent human antibody and TH1 type T cell responses, that's with BNT B1. <laughs> so that's with the fold on one, right? Yeah, yeah, that's <laughs> with the f fold on one. So it, it's interesting from a scientific perspective. And I'm right. But not interesting from a let's judge who's actually in the running to <laughs> produce a vaccine because this data is all just. It shows, I guess what it shows, like if we were investors, it would show investors that they have the methodology down, right, yep. to test these things. So of course they're gonna test it in their lead candidate as well. And the data is probably real good, but they're just not gonna show us yet. Yeah, probably I mean, if, if you invest in like, oh, the other one, they, if this one is this good, then the other one must be really good. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, but actually, but, show us the data. <laughs> we'll make the yeah. decision ourselves. <laughs> from a from a commentator's pet point of view, they they've just shot their horse and go, "We're going to bring a new horse. It's going to be much better." I'm like, "Okay, <laughs> but like, yeah, yeah, exactly. Like, this, nothing to see here. Nothing to see here. We've got something much better." I'm like, "Okay, <laughs> okay. <Well, laughs> show us the data. I mean, I, it's, I mean, I really don't think that they'll. I mean, it has to be better. It has to be. Otherwise, like, why would they do it?" <laughs> yeah, well, I, I mean, it's interesting, right? Like the now that they're going with a full length spike protein, that's putting it in a more similar comparison, right, to the Moderna one. Yeah, and they were using uh, full length or at least like a region. So it's like, I mean, I don't know, right? Like what decisions sometimes are made on the scientific versus business basis. Right? It yeah. could also be that people understand this better, right? Or that the clinical trial enrollment is going to be better set up to interpret like this. Right? Maybe yeah. it's a better for a head-to-head -head -head comparison. Right? There's all these different factors that might go into that. Yeah, I mean, I guess like because they, they've got all their internal data to compare against, and so they could be nothing. Pick... We we, yeah, we only we have know what they nothing. tell us. <laughs> oh, I mean, just wild speculation. Yeah, wild <laughs> speculation. Uh, let's see what else have we got on the on the docket for for things. Um, so you talked about Moderna a bit. They the they... self amplifying one. Ooh, yeah. So, like, they so in Pearl College. I had College, this on the two weeks ago one as well. Yeah. <laughs> so this is like, this is a, a a bit of a crazy one because it's I think it's by Imperial College London, and so there's the university going all on their own to try and make a make their own vaccine candidate apparently. <laughs> uh, and yeah, I think there at the moment I'd classify them as like dead last. Yeah, the, they're this is preclinical stuff. Yeah. <laughs> They're still in like mice, basically, but they are like people. So I mean, they are like in there, and it's interesting the the science of self because it's not something I've looked into too much, like self amplifying RNA, and mm -hmm. so that 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 from a scientific perspective would be interesting, and I think that's kind of the like I think the priority is the, the science rather than the because I think self amplifying RNAs are like seen as the next generation after this mm -hmm. after. Mm -hmm. 
So this is more like, yeah. okay, well, we want to... Yeah, get... show us a RNA vaccine first and then give us the RNA vaccine that does something kind of cool. Yeah. So this is very much like funding for the, fu for the future. It's So they're like... So, I mean, this probably won't be like the the winning coronavirus vaccine, but they will develop the technology for... But, but I think what's important to remember, too, is that um, vaccines change over time as well. Like yeah. the vaccine that our parents got, right, for tetanus, measles, mumps, rubella, that's not the vaccine that we got yeah. for tetanus, mumps, measles, rubella, or whatever, right? Like those things have evolved over time. Um yeah, and like I, so you know, it's good that this stuff is also being done at the same time because if there are deficiencies that are found with the ones that we're getting, it's possible that some of these other technologies, you know, now this now we're talking like who knows, like five years down the yeah. line, right? Like those vaccines will improve and be able to be distributed. Well, I mean, COVID nineteen is almost like a Sputnik moment for vaccine science, where like mm -hmm. people finally want to like put in loads of money for for it, and so yeah. so it's allowing for lots of new and interesting science to be explored. And this is yep. kind of an example of that, like new and interesting science. So that's mm -hmm. why I kind of find it fascinating because it, because even if it doesn't, because it will like this is the kind of thing that will pay dividends on later. It, it, it like just for our understanding of science, for and also like for other treatments. Um, for sure, yeah, for sure. I mean, even if so, like at some level, right? We've talked about this that there's different pa types of papers that we've seen on vaccines. Sometimes we're seeing vaccine papers that like pushing towards getting the data to go into clinical trials. But then there's also, there could be vaccine papers out that's like, how does this vaccine work, yeah. right? Like, and that's still great. Like they're getting funded because of this situation. Awesome. But the insights into how a vaccine might work will, I mean, we still don't know how like the vaccines that we use work exactly on the mechanistic oh, level, yeah. right? We have, we have a, a broad idea of like the type of immunity, the type of T cells that are important, the type of cells that are important, um, but the exact role of the antigens or the adjuvants, like we don't really know. Oh yeah, I mean, speaking of which, I mean the BCG vaccine is yes, is a, yeah, yes, that's being tested. yeah. We talked about that last time too. That that there's this mysterious property, right? That's just known from the clinical perspective. Yeah. Um, so how does that actually give us immunity to this virus? People can only hypothesize at the moment. Yeah, there's a trial running where people are testing BCG. And I think there was a... I, I did glance yeah, at the that's paper. Escobar et al. BCG protection from severe coronavirus vaccine. Yeah. PNAS, published. Yeah, I mean, I yeah, PNAS. Uh, <laughs> oh, I mean, yeah, that's true. They have that, uh, what, uh, contributor, editor, review? What is that, yeah. board? PNAS... You can, they're they're tagged like that though, right? Like yeah, the, if, the, if they get through that way, we should yeah. explain this, right? So yeah, PNAS is the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, uh, American institution, right? Of scientists, they have like all these different members, and um, generally thought of as a prestigious journal. <laughs> yeah, um, I think I'm, I don't know. It does it, publish good research because it has a National Academy of Sciences before, so there are lots of brilliant scientists there. But yeah. it is also kind of like an old boys club of journals where it, sometimes it, sometimes you, you get lots of great people publishing there and you get lots of great quality stuff. But sometimes you get some really wild stuff coming, coming mm -hmm. through there just because they know the right people. My, my favorite one was where they, uh, this is completely unrelated to microbiology, but where, they, where someone tried to prove that, that, that like butterflies and, and caterpillars were the result of uh, a fly having... Copulated with a with a worm and then create. Oh, bizarre. What year yeah. was that though? It was like a long time ago or a recent? It was. It was last. It, 50 yeah, it was years. Quite, yeah, it was. It was when I was in the university. So okay, okay, so, so quite yeah, a long time. Last ago. ten years. Yeah. Well, last <laughs> last ten years. So yeah, it was. <clears throat> It wasn't too far. Yeah, well, uh, one of the reasons that that could happen, well, first of all, yes, because it is this National Academy of Sciences, there's a social element around it, yeah. right, with all the people that are part of that. But furthermore, it's also, I'm not sure if they got rid of it, but like when I was going through grad school, there was a specific mechanism where you could like escalate a paper into the review cycle if you had a National Academy's board like escalate it up. Oh, yeah. Um, and that's that. What's happens if you've got like someone to like to like spot you and say like, oh, this mm -hmm. person is really good. You can even yeah. like c collect your own reviews and and come yeah. come with them. So, yeah, they they're it. Yeah. <clears throat> so I mean, the thing is like that, and it's both like, yeah, I can. It's, it does a, if 
it relies on the on like the people on the National Academy of Sciences not being like weak and human and like giving into like emotions and stuff. For sure. But, for sure. And every but you know head. they 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 publish the paper and so at the end of the day like it's out there so we can we can read it right we can yeah, read it exactly if necessary we can email the authors to try to get more information so you know it's still a journal there is review right like yeah. the data's out there it's not just nothing it's uh, yeah. certainly more rigorous than a preprint I would say right yeah. because uh, oh, someone yeah. has looked at it <laughs> in a yeah. formal fashion. But maybe not as rigorous as like a preprint that has tons of press attention that tons of people are like commenting about. I right? mean, you know, there's all these yeah. different things. <clears throat> I mean, not as rigorous as a preprint that has ended up on like pub peer, and then everyone's like every, looks at every single line for an error. Yeah, it's brilliant. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, these days there is more to peer review than just what happens behind what journal like like walls. Like so. Mm hmm. And, and course, it'll probably be our our come our, our returning point all the time is that like listening to us and like following along with these papers you're doing your own sort of peer review yeah right <laughs> um you're trying when, to make a decision for yourself how much to believe and what to learn from the data that you're seeing yeah um with all the limitations that come with that right like not being an expert in that field right like having us as your guides <laughs> like all those things like hobble you at some level but um again like your direct engagement with that process is much more than just reading the headline yeah, exactly. And it, it, it directs you to look at how the authors came to their conclusions. And it's a lot more interesting to, like, you're at, everybody who reads a paper is taking a part in that peer review process, especially if you read it and go, hang on, I don't agree with this. This is <laughs> this is terrible. I've got my own I ideas. And suddenly, you, you basically, like, a lot of, I mean, having worked at journals, I know that many peer reviews are like an internet con comment section. So mm, it, they can be. The classic reviewer two meme. <laughs> oh, but there was an entire website called the Third Reviewer that used to be up where people would post their worst reviewers. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah. So uh, I just want to say that there was a Ars Technica article published on the twenty seventh. Uh, Meet the four front runners in the COVID vaccine, COVID nineteen vaccine race. Um, so that's like an interesting place people go to find more information about mm -hmm. these vaccines and how they're all competing to be the first one. And then a couple um, a couple episodes ago, we also talked about the Milken Institutes. I had heard that from TWIV, COVID-19 Treatment and Vaccine Tracker. And th yeah. there they have a huge list of like all the hundreds that are going through. And, and we'll come back to talking about these, right? Probably. Oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> I mean, I didn't create this overlay just for one episode. I assume this is going to be an ongoing segment. Right, right. <clears throat> Uh, yeah, what else is there? I mean, Sinovac is still I, the the weekly reminder that Sinovac still exists, but they don't haven't released any data. But theoretically, they should be really far in the lead because they had they have an inactivated virus, which is mm -hmm. pretty much like old school vaccine. Like the first like vaccines were always like dead viruses. So yes, so, yes, that one is. Um... I guess I shall, I'll move it into the potential article or uh, folder right now if people watch this and follow along. But that's uh, uh, Gao et al. Rapid Development of Inactivated Vaccine Candidate for SARS-CoV-2. Published in, on May 6th. They were very early to give us the data. Yeah. <clears throat> so, yeah, it's, a, it's sad that we haven't got more from them yet. But, I mean, uh, what else is there? There's also, uh, let me see if I can pop up another... Uh, thing because the because johnson and johnson have their adenovirus 26 candidate which they just released an article about what what it does in in rhesus macaques so so another human adenovirus yeah except this one is supposed to be more rare uh mm. and it's and it's po so i mean and I, studying it in rhesus macaques will not tell us whether or not humans have <laughs> so to do it yeah <laughs> <laughs> but from the mechanistic point, they're showing us they can get it get into the cells and and elicit an immune response. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so let's see if I can pull pull that up quickly. Uh, transition. So yeah, a uh, single shot adenovirus twenty six vaccine protects against SARS CoV two in CoV two in rhesus macaques, and like this one seems to be like. So yeah, I mean, uh, so I know that like uh, there's a blog that I follow called in the in the loop with Derek Lowe who who's compared a bunch of these like adenovirus vaccine candidates in in macaques or no, mm. all the vaccine candidates that have been published in macaques and I think I'll, I can hopefully I can oh I see like macaques has been the common model in which that we see all the vaccines yeah I mean I hope he won't be annoyed if I like 
uh, share put his table up on the stream on the stream, but uh, yeah, because because apparently like the Johnson Johnson looks like really good compared to the other ones at the moment, mm. but again, macaques it's hard to I mean, as you mentioned that very the fact they use a human adenovirus makes it very difficult to predict what, how good it'll be in humans. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like I like what. I guess the question is always, what are we learning, right? When we when we test it in an animal model, right? Mm. And in my mind, we're not learning safety, except in the broadest strokes. Mm. Especially when our, yeah, uh, yeah, we're definitely we're not learning safety. Um, we're learning efficacy, like the, an immune system responding, right? This idea, like macaque immune system is probably much similar us, more similar to us than a mouse, yep. right? Um, like certainly they uh, are not as evolutionarily distant, so they should have some more similarities. Like they get a fever, right? When we talk about like mice don't really get that fever, yeah, um, right. So at least we know that part of the immune system is similar. Uh, so when they're saying it's better, so I didn't see which column here was um, was. So, so the they Johnson. got the J and J is the John. So it's the one in the middle. Uh, then there's like they got the yeah. So six six monkeys per dose. Uh, but in terms of like like only a few of these actually have like T T cell res like results in them, and they basically look at like kind of the outputs we want to be looking at is like the nasal like small subgenomic RNA output. So, so I mean that's interesting, right? Like uh, I wonder whether or not because we don't know whether it's antibody versus T cell, right? That is the yeah. protective immunity. Uh, certainly, as time has gone on, more people have been vocal about saying like what we talked about last week, that T-cell immunity is a very important part of the viral immune response. So we would expect that the vaccine would go down that way. Oh, certainly knowing that the BCG vaccine has some sort of effect, right? That's yeah. probably not humoral immunity <laughs> that's coming out from the BCG, right? It's not antibodies yeah. produced, right? That's giving you the protection. There's something else that's happening. Yeah, I think I saw there's like a... a I wish I'd added this list. There's a study that... Because there's been theory that just any sort of vaccine like can create a generic immune response that makes the body more responsive to more like on high alert to damage sure. that happens. Yeah, so like just being boosted for something beforehand. I mean, on Twiv, uh, the host of that, Vincent, he's a poliovirus dude, mm. and he heard that poliovirus. <laughs> there's there's studies saying oral poliovirus vaccine will give you a boost in immunity against COVID. Um, and then, like, that's one of those things where it's like, that's an incredibly shelf stable, you know, like, yeah, the efforts to eradicate polio, you know, it's at a stage where, like, it's like, how many people in the entire world, right, like, have this disease still, and they're trying to get it out. So it's a very accessible um, compound to yeah. get, similar with BCG, much more accessible than, like, getting a, a new vaccine oh, yeah. created. And much more pleasant. They, like, stick on a sugar cube that you have to eat, and it's, and it's oh. like, oh, this is really nice. Uh, I can do oh, more of that. Vaccine. Yeah. Can I have yeah. another one? I remember when I was a kid, I was like, can I have another one? And, like, they're like, no. Oh, did you have the, you had the oral polio virus vaccine? Yeah, I think when I was a kid, I, I had, like, had ah. that oral virus. I'm not sure if I had oral. I don't. Not, not, I don't recall. <clears throat> yeah, no. It was. It was, it was really tasty. Um, <laughs> <laughs> speaking of, of vaccines, uh, the Any, oh. Inovio. <laughs> I love talking Inovio. about Inovio because their vaccine is is crazy. Oh, um, the DNA. The DNA skin patch one. Oh, the D, the DNA part is is that's not the interesting. Part. The interesting part is how they apply it through electroporation. Which is it's just this is wonderful. Uh, yeah. Because I, we didn't mention we don't want to create a vaccine that that accidentally causes people pain, but the Novio <laughs> way deliberately causes people pain. So uh, let me see if I can and find out where I stuck. Yeah. Oh gosh. Yeah. Inter. So yeah. This is. So yeah. Intradermal delivered DNA vaccine provides anamnestic uh, protection in a rhesus macaque SARS-CoV-2 challenge model. So. We, we've talked about the Inovio vaccine before because I, yeah, I didn't... we did. I was trying. I can't remember what animal model we spoke about it in. It was. I think it was a mouse model. We or mouse and yes, it was. In, it was in a mouse. Yeah, it was in a yeah. mouse. There was. Uh, yeah. DNA um, vaccine in mice. <clears throat> yeah, and so now they take it to rhesus macaques, and so <laughs> the thing they don't really like point out in in the studies that they they do mention like they they use an electroporator. But they, what they don't describe is like that it is basically a bunch of needles that they stick into you that electrocute you, 
and they did yes and I, I think we talked about they had a study on like uh, how painful did you on a scale of <laughs> one to ten and like from like the least painful to the most painful thing I've ever felt and they scored about a seven <laughs> <laughs> in I mean, the middle there I, painful. I, just, I, I mean I, I just feel like like it's, it's the one I I don't want this one to, I want Inovio to lose because <laughs> I don't want to get electrocuted for, <laughs> I feel like like It'd be hard to, like, be, uh, like, all these anti-vaccine people, I'd be like, your vaccines don't cause harm, and then nobody will be there, like, electrocute people. I'm like, you, you're ruining my <laughs> argument. <laughs> and you so, only get shocked once, luckily. <laughs> yeah, you only... I'm, I, guess if, I guess if you go in for your booster, if that's the thing that you're going to be doing. <laughs> yeah, you're not going to be going to your booster. Um, yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> oh yeah i mean speaking of like so i mean i think that's pretty much most of the the things i was looking at for, for this week i mean i have heard talk of challenge studies which is like the ultimate catch 22 of of vaccine research where anybody who wants to do them probably need isn't hasn't been had informed consent otherwise they wouldn't want to do them but well no oh you're saying just like you you heard more news about um yeah, human challenge studies. So yeah, this. I think Chaddox they wanted to do some human challenge studies, mm. uh, and I just I don't think that's a very good idea at all. Yeah. Well, but, that means yeah. So wait, probably to clarify, right? That means like you get the vaccine and then you're intentionally challenged with the yeah the infectious disease. They yeah. deliberately like force the infectious disease onto you. They mm. again not they don't know what the natural dose for causing an infection is, so they'll have to choose one. Yeah. And so, like, so there's two, two options. They go for oh. the highest amount of dose, which is crazy, because I think we already... Because there have been studies done that, like, the dose of COVID you get initially can actually have a big effect on how severe the disease gets, which is one of the reasons why face masks are good, because... Have we, not... have we seen... Have we talked about that st uh, a study like that? I feel like we should add that to the potentials <laughs> list. So, yeah. <clears throat> um, because how would, they, how would they know dose? How do you measure the dose? In yeah. a post, right? In a in a retrospective or whatever. How would you know the dose that someone received? Yeah, I just point. feel like you can't answer it. I don't. <laughs> no, you you are. That's a very very good point. Yeah, um, I, I just mean it'll be indirect. Like whatever way of measuring yeah. how much virus someone gets, it'd be indirect. Yeah. And so add that on top of like the messiness of looking at human data <laughs> to find signal. Then I'm just like, okay. I mean, we know in animals, dose makes a big yeah right has yeah, a right. big effect so like i'm not i'm not so predisposed to not believe that but i mean uh saying that the study is out there that makes me quite skeptical <laughs> yeah uh, i think some of people have talked about but not necessarily that because again if i i would have i should have if i yeah next time i i usually like save these studies just so that when i receive something crazy like there's a study on like how seaweed can there's a bunch of studies on how random things can cure like covid in a petri dish like <laughs> Like, mm. oh yeah, the, these, if you add uh, various extracts or some things, it, and things petri dishes don't really tell us to, so I mean, there was this really massive, like, drug study, where they did, like, a lot of drug repurposing, where they, they put a load, tested a load of drugs in, in, in a petri dish to see whether it stopped, like, the COVID-19 from replicating. Mm. Uh, but again, it's things in a petri dish. And again, and you're only looking at very, like, at very, very early stages of infection that you want that. Sure. So, it'd have to, <laughs> so it's. So, yeah, it's something that I might want to talk about. But again, those drug repurposing studies are basically looking at how people throw shit against the wall and seeing what sticks, which isn't this. Yes. So, it's, so, I mean, yeah, that's the thing Like we've discovered is like talking about the vaccine studies and treatment studies isn't really as interesting as talking about the pathogenesis studies for us. For us, yeah. I mean, like, I, in some ways, like, I'd love to dig into some of those Petri dish ones just because you get something there's something more meaty for us to talk about, not just like, oh, is this safe? Is this like, is this working? Like we're actually going down like one of those hypotheses, but but then it suffers from that idea that it's not as relevant for like yeah. a, a someone to like listen to and be like, oh, this is how it's gonna like change like my thinking about um, like whether or not I'm gonna get the vaccine. Like, no, we're not actually, it's not gonna <laughs> give that insight at all. Like it's just telling us like how we think the infection is happening. Yeah. Uh, so. Along that line, I did find a. Oh, do you have something else? No, no, along no, that no. line, I did have. Um, uh, where is this in the potentials? Uh, oh yeah, Malay et al. SARS-CoV-2 infection of a primary human lung epithelium for COVID-19 modeling. 
So that's very cell culture based. Um, and it's something that I did in grad school, which was, well, maybe we can try to make cell culture more relevant by adding complexity into it, by adding a tissue structure. Oh, yes. Uh, so these, I think, are these are air liquid interface epitheliums, which mean that they sort of differentiate into the ciliated sort of alveolar cells. I think they get spotted in with the different surfacant creating cells. So uh, it's a weird name? type of cell culture. Oh, um, SARS-CoV-2 infection. Here, I'll just throw it in the chat. <clears throat> Moulay, M-U-L-A-Y at all. <clears throat> uh, Bioarchive preprint. Okay, uh, right. Yeah, so in this one they make, or, well, uh, we call them organoids. I, I think they're still calling them that because they're yeah. not quite organs, but they're still made of uh, cells uh, in vitro cell culture, but they have some, um, yeah, they have some structure to them. And uh, these people just, you can dive into a bit more mechanistically, right? Because the cell culture, um, like regular cells in a cell culture dish, they're they, they're not as differentiated, right? They kind of like they do their weird thing where they love growing on plastic and yeah. uh, at high and sometimes at very high growth rates. Um, but like that's not what happens in our organs. Like we have uh, yeah. yeah. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, I remember like we did something like this in my lab with like tonsil so, tonsil blocks. Which is... <laughs> it's such a sci-fi thing, right? Like, I think that one of the things that attracted me to this technology is because it does sound very sci-fi, tonsil blocks. Well, it's a, well, it sounds sci-fi, but it's at least sci so, like, so, lots of kids get their tonsils taken out. Uh -huh. And whenever that happens, one of my friends would, would run down to a hospital on a bicycle and grab some of those tonsils uh, yes. and bring them to the lab. Yeah, ex-vivo. Yeah, ex-vivo <laughs> tissue. So, like, mm -hmm. hey, you're throwing out some organs you don't want? Let us do some science with them. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I mean, that's in some ways like like there's um, those are the two models that kind of have to, in my mind, have to do, like uh, dovetail together. Right. Like if you show something in the organoid, get doing an ex vivo version is like the perfect way of just like connecting the yeah. dots. Right. Like being like we saw it here and we see it here. This is a good model. <laughs> yeah. And it's so, so different because you need to find like patients who are willing to give up their their organs or like find a so, so you have to be connected to a hospital. You have to. Have all this infrastructure because mm -hmm. I mean, like the yes. reason why they use the and I mean the consent process for that is also really really important, right? Because when you're turning human products into something that I mean, as scientists, as data collectors, right, we're commodifying that data. Yeah. Like uh, you got to be really careful about how that's consented and how IRB um, touches those processes. Yeah, I mean even like how you how, how you transport them as well, pressure. like kind of co mm -hmm. couriers. Oh yeah, yeah. Like take, taking things via taxi. I mean, like. Like, I think there's, like, an agreement that you don't take anything on the London Underground because cause the, <laughs> the prospect for disaster, like, oh, look, someone's, like, stolen my bag. They've stolen all my tonsils, and they're going to think I'm a serial killer. <laughs> oh, like, oh, look, going to get his Walkman. Oh, what the? What the? F what are these guys into? <laughs> <laughs> oh. Yeah, so there's that model. Um... There is a pair of papers that I, I don't know if I want to talk about these on the on week, but I just want to throw yeah. it out there. They were covered by TWIV. Um, there are more takedowns of hydroxychloroquine. Oh, gosh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, they did one in human lung cells and they did one in non-human primates. Yeah. Um, and they both went down. I guess those are supposed to touch each other because, again, they're like meeting halfway. Right, that uh, there's no mechanistic. They couldn't find any evidence that the mechanisms are working in, in the way that they but think that they, they are. Did they try it with zinc? <laughs> did, <laughs> they, did you try it with uh, uh, calcium? Did you try it with vitamin D? Did you... Oh dear, <laughs> a whole slew. Your insert your favorite multivitamin yeah, or totally. nutritional I mean, supplement here. Like that. That's all. That's been like the refrain now. Like where like. It, I mean, now I just do it to mess with people, like, go, oh, this vaccine did work. Yeah, but did you try it with a sink? <laughs> like, <laughs> Actually, funny that you said that. So uh, another paper that I picked up here is um, Clausen et al. Again, I'll just uh, so, I am the titles if you're searching it. Okay. Uh, C-L-A-U-S-E-N. SARS-CoV-2 infection depends on cellular heparin sulfate and ACE2. Um, so, like, I think... Uh, very early in this, I mean, we have them in the potentials as well, is the identification of ACE2 as the receptor yes. and the importance of that. 
but I guess in this one, they're also seeing that um, heparin sulfate is required. That's just something that's something that floats in our blood. Yeah. Is it, um, I mean, I th- and just showing that it's important for oh, ACE2 right. to bind. Because I, I thought like, um, heparin was like a snake venom thing that like stops gl- blood from like clotting. And this is kind of something similar to that. But... Uh, so, yes. So, like... Yes, I think, uh, yeah, it's the same, I think, uh, yeah, in blood clotting, some toxins target heparin yeah. sulfate as well so, to produce the effects. Uh, oh, right, I see what it is. So, like, where the heparin so- would, like, bind to, that's what they're looking at. So, yep. they're not actually looking at like, mm-hmm. whether snakes like, will be immune to COVID or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. So, <laughs> yeah, okay. So, they basically, like, test it using, I mean, this is... They're, it's like uh, they try to add some complexity into their biochemistry, right? Uh, like just looking at receptor binding, but now in the presence of this heparin. Yeah, sulfate. seeing like what, whether it competes or not with the SARS-CoV-2, which is, uh, I mean, I get, I guess that's in, yeah. Um. <laughs> I mean, it's again, it's it's binding dynamics, right? No, this is they're calling this is not something exogenous in our. I think we have heparin in our blood. Is it? I'm not. Sure. No? I don't think so because I mean I think hep- heparin. This is like a Wiki- this is a Wikipedia yeah, question. <laughs> I'm, pre- I'm pretty because I was because I remember like whenever we're taking blood, always add heparin to them to stop it from clotting and being all nasty. So yes, that's right, that's right. Anti, it's an anticoagulant. Yeah. And <laughs> I, I remember hearing like that, that. Oh, it was like so because there was like one many like hot drugs that was like come from comes from poison or so. I'm just. Yeah, but they're saying they're calling it surface. They call it cellular heparin sulfate in the title. So, so that just made me think that it was something that's in the. Because I, they, yeah, I they talk no, about the, the so... binding sites of heparin rather than the the thing that, that they look at is heparin's target and because of naming conventions, every target is named after the thing that targets it. So. Um... No, they're they're in there. Yeah, basic disaccharide subunit of heparin sulfate. No, I think we have some in our blood. Okay. Uh, right. Okay. Uh, uh, I mean, I... yeah. I mean, we don't have to have as much of it, right, as like what's yeah. required. Hmm. That's interesting. It's, it's a medication. Just oh, this right. is a, as a medication. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Heparin is produced by Basaville's mast cells and mammals. Right. Okay. <laughs> yeah. No, I. Yeah. So no, I I mean you're right. It is an anticoagulant, right? Like that is like when we make a bunch of it, that's how we use it. But yeah. this is sort of saying that in the blood, right? Like in in the in vivo binding condition, there might be other things that help um, the receptor bind to the uh, SARS-CoV-2 spike protein. And again, I don't know what the application of that is because it's you know like it's not like we're gonna be able to deplete all the heparin in our bodies. Like that's not a good path. Right, but it's more of that basic science questioning, right? Like, well, how what exactly goes into that binding, yeah. right? <clears throat> no, I mean this is one of those. Yeah, this is. Yeah, I mean, I think the viewers would have seen me like quickly sk- look at Wikipedia on what heparin to figure to, to figure out how wrong I was about <laughs> it. <laughs> <laughs> it's one of those moments where like you're so wrong, you think, am I in an alternate dimension? No, no, I was just really wrong. <laughs> <laughs> always learning. Yeah, always learning. That's part of the joy of taking part in science. You're always finding out how how wrong you are, and then going, okay, well, I just have to move on from that. <laughs> totally. Um, and then the other paper that I am offering, or that I just found this week to offer up, uh, is this uh, NSP1 uh, non-structural protein one uh, binds to ribosomal mRNA channel to inhibit translation. So this is about how the virus, um, during its regular infection cycle, how, how this NSP1 protein works. Right. Um, which I think, and it's, it's it's part of the replicase complex. Yeah. If I remember. Yeah, we right? did we talk talked about... about it last week in the yeah. T cell in the T cell thing. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, yeah, because one A and one B. So, uh, oh no, they're saying this is a virulence factor here. NSP one suppresses hope. Maybe that was there was a different NSP. Uh, yeah, I mean, we it, talked about last week. Yeah, it's weird because of na- name conventions, and it, it is very difficult. Sometimes, like people get confused over the genes, and so it's. But 
I mean, when it's just NSP a number, that's like really hard to. It's really hard to yeah, follow. Guess, like some proteins <laughs> do perform multiple functions, but I'm. But no, I think we're talking about different NSPs though, maybe, because uh, like I think last week was NSP seven mostly, and uh, so maybe we didn't talk about NSP one. Ah, maybe that. Maybe that's what it was. Yeah, maybe that's what it was. So yeah, I mean, again, this it's interesting because I mean, virulence factors are just. I mean, what you define as virulence factor can vary depend because sometimes virulence factors are things that have one function, but then the virulence factor is a secondary function. So, uh, yes, that's true. Yeah, so it could be a virulence factor, but only in the sense that it's. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't think like there's, I'm because I'm sure there's a def. Let's see. I'm just I'm gonna pop open that old page. I just want to see what we were talking about last week. NP N NP. No, yeah, not NSP. NP. Oh yeah, that's what we were talking about. Yeah, nu nuclear nucleocapsid, yeah. but NSP that is that is something yeah, that is not uh, nice. different. But yeah, we're learning more about the various proteins that cause that COVID uses. So it's actually interesting. Yeah, but NSP one comes from ORF one. I'm pretty sure. Oh, maybe uh, not. Yeah, no. I mean, it okay. is interesting because again, this goes into pathogenesis and actually like the molecular level pathogenesis. That's what is. Molecular level pathogenesis, yeah. So like, once the virus gets in and makes some proteins, what do those yeah. proteins do? So, <laughs> in right in the infection, we know the end result is make more virus, but what specifically does yeah. do they do? I mean, do? this is like what I like microbiology for, like finding out how the, the viruses work, how these tiny little molecular machines can mm -hmm. hijack, because they don't do anything themselves. They're lazy. They try to use get humans to do as much, or their their hosts to do as much of the work as possible. So yeah, so, yeah, yeah. It, yeah, and, it, and it's these proteins that, like, facilitate that switch from, like, regular metabolism to viral yeah. metabolism. Yeah, it, it literally does, like, they, it, I mean, the, the cells stop being your cells and start being the virus's cells. And, mm -hmm. like, I mean, because mm -hmm. I know there's always this argument over, like, uh, are viruses alive? And they, they kind of are, but only when they take over their host, yeah. basically. They only have metabolism. I think we say no. <laughs> I mean, you know, in the news, there's a lot of that, too, because they say live virus, but I think probably better to say active and inactive virus, right, I think would be the more accepted um, term. Yeah, I think that'd be live more virus. accepted, but I think it's more understandable for the normal per normal people to say live and dead. Right, right, just say yeah. live, yeah, yeah, live and yeah, dead. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> it, I understand, like, kind of when we go into, like, the definitions of what is alive and what isn't alive, it it is fascinating for, for like, people, like, tax... <laughs> You gave you the idea. You know, so people want to make sure that everything's in the right column. It's very important. Like, live or dead means to make sure they're in the right drawer. Like, rocks, yeah. viruses, same drawer. <laughs> <laughs> but, I mean, it's because it's like that, that kind of age old argument is a sperm alive or is it like. Uh, so, I feel like. Like the viruses are kind of akin to that argument, but that's my perspective on things. I know other people. This is a contentious issue because it's. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Very contentious. Because like, <clears throat> yeah. Um. So yeah. So that's so we have that slew of vaccine things, and then, um. And then these, the bunch that I just talked about. Oh. I, I don't want to do the hydroxychloroquine on ones. No. I, I just wanted to add in there that there is more data now. Like some of it's cell culture and some of it is a primate model. Um, yeah, more evidence I, to say that's not At this point, it feels like bullying. To, to... Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It feels like... Yeah. But I mean, also it's also good. I mean, for yeah. the scientific community, it's good that this stuff exists, right? Because like people need to know for sure what works and what doesn't work. <clears throat> yeah. I mean, I did want to um, float one more paper that was like... The, oh, yeah, please. Uh, so I think we've talked about this one before, but adaptation of SARS-CoV-2 in biopsy mice for testing vaccine eff efficacy. So I'll post... Yes. So we, we talked about the preprint, but now it's it made it to publication. And, and I just find it funny because cause firstly, it's about pathogenesis. And secondly, it's, a, it's basically creating a chemical weapon to fight against mice. Like, they've taken <laughs> a, a virus that wouldn't usually affect mice, and they've genetically modified it, and so it affects mice. If it was the other way around, these people would be war criminals. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> well, also we don't know what sort of disease it causes in mice. Yeah, that's true. Uh, but we hope it causes we hope it causes COVID nineteen because that's we can study, right? <laughs> yeah, we, we hope that it causes a disease like COVID nineteen, but there's no way of knowing. Because, well, I mean, I guess the way of knowing is to read this paper and figure out what they used yeah. to test. Can it. you throw me the the yeah? I'll, I'll throw you the throw you the link for it. Uh, can, I see the DOI on the, it's right up there. It's easier for me to add things using that. Okay, oh <clears throat> uh, yeah, there. 
So I'll just post the, the link for you. Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah, that's right. We talked about this one in the preprint form. And it also comes, there's another companion, or like there's like two sides of this, right? Because um, also in a previous animal model we talked about, they made yes. a transgenic mouse that expresses human ACE2. So like on the on this side, they <laughs> uh, were able to give um, a virus that was modified, right, to infect uh, the mouse. Uh, but you could also modify the mouse to be more yeah. susceptible to the uh, virus. I mean, both of those are kind of interesting, like counterpoints to each other. And in terms of like pa pathogenesis, it's mm -hmm. interesting to like <laughs> compare because what, because we often have to take different things from animal models and figure out how they're relevant. And so, right. So yeah, that's like my last like pitch. <laughs> sure. Uh, what do the figures look like in this one? Yeah, because like, I think we did last time talk about it'd be nice to go to an animal model. We've talked about a yeah. bunch of clinical things, right? A, a bunch of trials. So. Um, uh, yeah, so I mean, we. I mean, there was that paper that we. I think we've been just been on this the where where they like. It, the gene therapy where they alter the mouse, I think, was, I think that was quite interesting because they didn't like create a genetically modified. What they did is they added created a virus that made them susceptible to to the to SARS-CoV-2, and then. Oh yeah, that's yeah yeah that's the other thing. Yeah, it's not even that the mouse line is like always like this. It's like only the mice that they yeah <laughs> uh, they tested, basically yeah went down that. Or only the mice that they treat with this gene therapy. Effectively, they, they 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 give the virus two genetically mod the the mice two genetically modified viruses in order for them to have an infection, which is really fa fascinating from like <laughs> both the perspective. Like, well, yeah, well, no, no, not the in this one they actually can give the oh, yeah. the regular virus. In the right? It's just one. In this yeah. one, they so the we're talking. Something has to change. Is it yeah. virus or is it mouse? So I mean. <laughs> So, how many figures in that in that science paper? You may uh, have to resend the link. Okay, hold on a minute. Let's I didn't see if I can. It. Or just resend yeah, the UI. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. that's that... happened. Yeah. That thing. In the cell paper, there are three. There are four figures. Five. Five figures. Yeah. And they look at some. Uh, they look at some path. Of, Pathology slides of the lungs. They have uh, oh antibodies that they're making. Oh, they <laughs> grind up the organs and they see how many viruses appear in all of those. Um, yeah. Uh, oh, they even do some. Oh, I see. And they verify their model by by making sure that the lungs have the ACE two. I mean, it's it's actually I guess four. Four figures. If if this one, you think you're doing another double header, like doing the two... science. I think yeah, that, I don't that, know. I'd, <laughs> I'd be quite it's interested awesome. in doing that as well because it, this the comp... because they're very similar, especially if these are the establishment, right? These are the papers yeah. that are establishing things. And like mice are really <clears throat> important in preclinical research. We don't see much about them out there, but they are, and they're they are an important filter in what we decide is an important vaccine, and what isn't. So I think that this is quite yeah. interesting <clears throat> and knowing how knowing how the models work i mean none of the vaccine candidates in the race right now we're seeing are passing through this particular right. preclinical stage right like one of the things about it is that one of the things about the speed of the results is that like anything that had even an inkling of preclinical data was yeah, just like exactly do it into right like time to move but there could be ones that are like still like uh, working their way through preclinical that haven't like made it to their first phase one yet that would benefit from seeing these models. So we may see vaccine I think this also goes models. to like the Sputnik thing of like these may not be relevant for this outbreak, but they are new technology that have, that that have been accelerated because of it, and that's quite interesting because it mm -hmm. might mm -hmm. might play a role in the future. Like in if these actually turn out to be really reliable models. I mean, can you imagine if we ha suddenly have a new virus come out that? that attaches to a human protein and then suddenly people can spin up a new adenovirus that expresses that protein put it into mice and then like you have like a model for a virus that we've never seen before that's so right. i mean that's right. something or <clears throat> ways to adapt a virus to, to attack mice i mean that's again something that like if, you, if they've found a way to speed that up 
that would be quite interesting because I know that, like, the, for bacteria, they've tr definitely tried to create more models and versions which uh, do really, like, that replicate the human condition but using a slightly modified, like, vi uh, disease model. So I think that from that, that mm -hmm. perspective, it would be quite interesting to compare and contrast. And also, like, looking at the various... Oh, man, there's even... I'm sorry, I just, like, because I was searching for things and I just found... There's, there is a transgenic mouse model, May. Oh, this is weird. There's like an older version of a human ACE2. Yeah. I guess lots of people have been trying to pump these out. <clears throat> oh, so I guess, I mean, we might be doing another like two hour episode then if we look at all three. Yeah, I guess so. I mean, I, 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 oh, yeah. I mean, we could talk. We don't have to dive into the figures of all of them, but. I guess there's a lot. We should talk about. I, let's do it. Let's talk about mouse models. Mouse models. Spectacular. Let's talk about mouse models. Yeah, and and we'll focus on the one. We'll focus on like just the comparison between the two, right? One where they modify the virus, and one where they modify the mouse. Uh, but given that, it seems like there's probably a bunch of things that we'll be able to pull um, from previous literature. Yeah. Uh... <clears throat> so yeah, I think that's basically covered. So I think that so basically it'll be the mouse spectacular next week. Yes, yeah. yes. Because it's... <clears throat> Mouse model COVID-19 yeah. spectacular. I think that would be an interesting one. And <laughs> so I hope you've enjoyed an, our first look at all these random papers. Uh, the, look, most of them will be in the Z our Zotero link. So uh, that's shared in the comments. So if you want to look through them mm -hmm. yourselves, and if you see a paper that you're interested in that you want us to talk about, then feel free to contact us on our Twitters with the micro TWJC hashtag or like even in the comments of the, the, these uh, YouTube videos, which uh, I do t I do take a look at. Um, so, yeah, thank you very much. Yeah. It was great for you to join us, and yeah. uh, we'll see, see you next week. week. Bye. Bye.